Hello everybody, I'm your host Howell Curtis and I'd like to welcome you to The Space Industry by SatSearch, where we share stories about the companies taking us into orbit. In this podcast, we delve into the opinions and expertise of the people behind the commercial space organisations of today who could become the household names of tomorrow. Before we get started with the episode, remember you can find out more information about the suppliers, products and innovations that are mentioned in this discussion on the global marketplace for space at satsearch.com. Hello everybody and welcome to today's episode of the Space Industry Podcast. Now I'm joined today by Kelly Kitis ogborn Vice President of Space Commerce and Entrepreneurship at the Space Foundation. Kelly has worked in both the public and private sector in various roles. And before joining the Space Foundation, she was, for example, President and Chief Operating Officer of Advanced Rockets Corporation, a hypersonic flight company. And uh, she's also worked as a Congressional Liaison to DARPA, so really high-level serious uh, work and insights that we can hopefully get from uh, this conversation today. In this podcast, I want to pick Kelly's brain about commercialization in the space industry in 2024 and beyond. So let's kick off this uh, conversation. Now, the commercialization of space is a topic that our listeners are very familiar with. Uh, On this podcast, we feature dozens of private companies at various stages of the value chain uh, that are working in a commercial capacity and bringing innovation to market, improving how value from space is realized, how the industry, the wider industry, the, the, and the value chain can understand the opportunities there. But from your point of view, are you seeing any trends or patterns in the way that companies have been coming to market in the last few years compared to, say, five, 10 years ago when things were maybe not so advanced? That's a fantastic question. And Hal, I want to thank you for having me on this show today and as part of this discussion To answer that question, we're at actually a very interesting juncture in space. And in the past years, certainly space has captured the collective imagination of more and more people that are not only interested in space, but also thinking about how they can take advantage of space and become part of the the value chain, like you said, in the ecosystem. And we can really point to this for a couple of reasons. It's SpaceX's success and global marketing and branding, also NASA's renewed interest in going back to the moon with Artemis. And then also really compounded with this increased global engagement and and achievements, and certainly India landing back on the moon really, I think, sent ripples across the ecosystem. And so we're really at this point where we're moving beyond a moonshot and actually having very real conversations about a cislunar economy and what that could look like. And what that brings to bear is a lot of non-traditional engagement in space. So looking at both upstream and downstream, which is great, but it does affect business models, right? Because it provides tremendous opportunity as well as challenges. And that really comes as when you look at the landscape. So in terms of opportunities, more access being increased by the rocket equation, being cheaper, reliable, reusable, all the good things coming to bear increases activities that could happen in low earth orbit. And also the infrastructure that will be built out allows companies to interact with more of the value chain and engage with more of the value chain than they could have before. So I've seen a lot of business models really shifting, looking at the diversification of activities beyond geostationary, which traditionally is where a lot of the engagement happened. On the other side of that, there's a lot of challenges that come with that, which also affects business models. It's the strategy and how to do that, how to take advantage of the opportunity And also really how you can get the capital to scale can be quite difficult. And these companies approaching this landscape have to do a lot of different considerations. I think one of them is the customer base. For a lot of younger companies I see coming onto the scene, sometimes they have the idea that they want to go private alone. But um, commercial alone is really a myth. The government is still in many ways a funder, a validator, um, a tech integrator, a tech demonstrator. And so being able to understand that there is that dichotomy of customer bases really affects the trend and the strategy about how you build out and also really the capital environment. So right now, the capital environment, not just in space, but across the board can be quite challenging. But particularly in space, we're seeing reductions in valuations and reductions in the volume of fundraising available out there. It also takes longer to raise those funds. So that has affected companies coming onto the scene in terms of how they position their business models and how they actually position their use cases, because there's more urgency now on the investment side to have business cases that will pan out in a shorter time frame. 
So being able to be agile, being able to be iterative, being able to demonstrate capabilities or wins quickly is really important. And then the second piece of that is really coming up and looking at an integrated business model. If you're looking at an infrastructure within low earth orbit and all of these activities within this cis lunar economy, there really aren't many independent actors. They have to fit into this broader ecosystem. And so that's really been something that I have seen affect how businesses think about engaging in space because that's a very different strategy in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. That was a, a really good um, range of points there. I think several of these issues come down to the stories that the companies are telling to their, their potential clients, their potential funders, et cetera. And internally, uh, um, even or even with regard to uh, hiring, space entrepreneurs, those building real businesses need to walk quite a fine line between promotion and hype. Do you think that entrepreneurs, or at least those that can easily grab the headlines, are sometimes guilty of building business cases or appearing to b- build business cases based on unrealistic precursors? If you're saying something like, all we need is Starship to be operational once a week by 2026, or all we need is three to five ISSS sized private space stations online by the end of the decade, and we're golden. Or as soon as there's a permanently manned moon base, we'll close our business case. And and these things attract investors, maybe those investors without as much technical knowledge of the domain. You might succeed in getting some funding, uh, but will you really attract the right engineering talent you need or the partners and collaborators that, that are required to progress? Or indeed, the space agency support, which you've mentioned, is applicable in every business case. Yeah, that is <laughs> such a poignant point to make. And the, really the way that I always talk about it when in the work that I do with entrepreneurs or, or high growth companies is being able to balance this enthusiasm for what the future brings to bear and the collective idea that we want to build together with this pragmatism and tangible roadmap of how to actually do it. Because as I mentioned earlier, the just the, the funding landscape, it's not just about cool new tech and ideas now. You actually have to make money. And particularly in the environment we're in now, where we saw the SPAC boom and bust, right? There were, there was all of this excitement, all of this hype about collective capabilities and this these integrated portfolios, but they didn't actually have a tail to make money, or the conditions within space and the business opportunities weren't there yet. A perfect example of this is when you talk about asteroid mining is being discussed as one of these main market drivers of the new space economy, but currently. There is no business model for it yet because we still have to fundamentally crack the code on how do you power things in space, re-entry, all of these other aspects that are around it. And yeah, so the market's actually at a really interesting point. And there are two ideas that are somewhat at odds. The first is that I always talk a lot about that there's never really been a better time to become part of space. But I also really think that space has a bit of an optics problem that goes both ways. And This is from the the business side and also the investment side. So from the business side, sometimes companies apply the the thought process of if you build it, they will come, which partially true if you build it within this broader landscape of what you want space to, to bring to bear, but there has to be some tangible roots. I think on the investment side, sometimes people get caught up in the hype because space is still very much talked about in this, these mythical terms. And I get where the reference is, because when space first came into our collective minds with the space race, we confronted the unknown with enthusiasm and innovation and did really hard things that had never been done before. We are now at a point where we have profitable and proven anchor markets within space that now allow for stability, creativity, and risk to all coexist. So the space industry is making money but you have to continue to make money to allow for those risks. And when you think about space as only being moonshots and, you know, only being these things that are going to put people on Mars colonies, I think it does companies a disservice because it doesn't actually talk about the economy around it. That's really bringing tangible results. About 95% of the ROI of the space economy now is the space to earth market. So it's either utilizing space-based data and services or tech transfer back on earth. And so for these companies, they need to understand how to build a strategy around that while keeping that excitement, but also being able to show proven returns and a tangible roadmap. And really what I've seen a lot 
from an investment side is that there is more interest in companies with demonstrated capabilities. So companies that have more mature and identifiable product market fit, a lot of companies looking at infrastructure, satellites, space hardware, all of these things that are more enabling and integrative that are really necessary to then grow those risky segments. And so for companies, they need to approach it from a stepping stone way, really knowing when business opportunities will become a real thing. And they can still posture the hype, right? Because that's what grabs the headlines. People want to pay attention to that, but they need to have a really critical roadmap about how they're going to achieve that. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a, that's a great answer. And I'm very pleased you mentioned the tech transfer uh, for terrestrial purposes. I think that's an often overlooked aspect of all this. Maybe not following the the COVID pandemic, we realized that there was a lot of latent engineering and capabilities in space companies that were able to be repurposed for different different uses. But yeah, we talk about often internally with the suppliers we work with that the engineering excellence that's required for your people to reach in order to operate effectively in space is so high. Absolutely. I end up getting into the conversation a lot with people about why we invest in space, right? Especially people that are not engaged in the ecosystem, engaged in the industry. They're like, they, they think it's wasteful, right? Because because there's real world problems people are facing on a daily basis. But I always tell them that space is going to benefit Earth in so many ways beyond the tech that's just, that's there. I point to their cell phone and I remind them that there's about 14 to 15 pieces of space tech and space hardware in their phone, but let alone if they use GPS to navigate or ordered something on Uber Eats or looked up the, the weather app to find out what it's going to be like when they go outside. But beyond that, because space is hard and because it's really capital intensive, but it also draws really smart, driven, pioneer type people. And so even if we don't achieve what that ultimate objective is within space tech, we are going to get better components, better processes, better ways of doing business on Earth that we don't realize yet. And then to your point about tech transfer, there's been plenty of technologies developed for space purposes that are use on Earth for no space means. Memory foam mattresses and clear braces and the uh, Black & Decker handheld um, vacuums. That drill initially was a lunar rock drill. So all of these fundamental household items, we have space to thank for that. More of an open question now. With this year gradually drawing to a close, what do you think 2024 is going to bring for the space industry? Where do you see the most interesting opportunities for entrepreneurs? That's a great question. I would say a couple of different ways. So looking at the next year, there's a lot of focus again on these established anchor segments. So satellites, of course, as we're starting to see a lot more uh, constellations go up in low Earth orbit and the uh, proliferation of satellites, it's going to just increase over the next 10 years. There's a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities in the utilization of space data. So being able to quantify it, being able to qualify it, being able to use it in industries and in ways that we haven't before. I recently learned that um, parametric insurance actually utilizes space data to be able to insure things in catastrophic events they've never been able to before. And that was very, it was an educational moment for me rather, because I never really positioned the insurance company or insurance industry rather as being part of the space ecosystem. But it just goes to show all of these really interesting, interesting applications and data is only going to continue to become more ubiquitous. I read a stat somewhat recently that postured and we'll see if it actually becomes a reality that space data may surpass oil and gas as the hottest commodity within the next 20 years primarily just because there's going to be such a diversity and amount of it. So that's definitely a really big entrepreneurial area. I also think that maybe not in 2024, but very closely after being able to utilize space for manufacturing purposes, specifically because manufacturing in zero G allows properties on earth that we haven't seen before. And this is really critical for the pharmaceutical industry or for medical devices or even the medical scene because they've now proven that they've been able to grow a liver in space because the lack of gravity allows the perfect conditions. They've been able to accelerate different treatments. For example, there was an osteoporosis treatment that was accelerated up in the ISS for, and it got fast-tracked through the FDA to be able to use on Earth. And so I think those conditions 
with the access to space becoming more usable by these industries is really promising and I think really exciting. And it opens up a lot of avenues for business ideas and creativity that haven't really been utilized before. And then I think my last one, I would probably put the ICE, the whole ISAM portfolio. So the in-space service assembly and manufacturing. So really looking at taking earth out of the equation, because if we're truly talking about opening business opportunities within space and within low earth orbit, we can't just rely on always transporting things from earth back up to space. And so how do we refuel in space? How do we manufacture in space? How do we repair in space? That area, I think, is very exciting. There's a lot of really smart, creative companies that are focusing toward those areas. And they, going back to a point I made earlier, they've definitely done some really impactful demonstrations. We now just get to need to get it to be more operational. So there's more money put into it that then allows that sector to expand. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, those are all yeah, really interesting areas and a lot of things that yeah, people should be keeping tabs on, and, uh, and I'm sure they are. And so just to um, mention here, now you, we, we've touched on this briefly, actually, it was the way you, you've explained this. We've helped a lot of manufacturing and engineering companies outside of the space industry enter the market in different ways. And, and when you think of space, as, as you mentioned, simply as an operating environment, as opposed to a different economy altogether, then uh, the market becomes very attainable to any software or hardware company that's got the capability to build technology that can survive and work and create value in that environment. And then Statwitch is one of the, the, the channels that can, ac- can be used to access that market. But in your experience, is the same true when you move closer to the end users of space data? We've heard consultant lines like every company should have a space strategy and, and there's inevitable pushback saying, obviously that's not true. But what do such companies need to consider when evaluating if and how to become a space company? Specifically tagged to space data or in general? Again, with the, with related to, to the data, yeah. Data. So I definitely agree with the concept that every company should have a space strategy, but what having a space strategy means is different for different companies. I think going back to the what we talked about earlier with this upstream and downstream, what I think is so interesting about the space ecosystem is how there are so many industries implicated in both sides and a lot of industries that rely on space data that don't position themselves within the ecosystem. But it's very critical to their core business. So for some companies, having a space strategy um, may mean in their minds going up to space, right? The upstream. But really what we're talking about here is the downstream. And when you start to have that conversation, you do realize that most companies already interact with space. They just don't have a strategy about how to utilize it better or how to grow. I would say that for them, to your point, it does become less less difficult to, to break into the market, right? Because you're not starting from scratch. You're just expanding operations that you have. I think for them... One of the things that I would think about is regulation that might hinder their business. So what I mean by this is that when you look at any sort of proliferation of innovation, uh, regulation and policy runs like five to seven years behind. And we saw this with the UAV market, for example, that UAVs were born out of Department of Defense technology transitioned into the commercial world. And then all of a sudden, I think people realized there were autonomous vehicles with cameras operated by private citizens that were flying anywhere around. And then the regulation followed with space and with data. There's going to be so much of it that I don't know if we're going to hit a regulatory roadblock of how it's collected, what's collected, how it's used. We're certainly not there yet because we're still proving the concept and growing the market. But I think that is something to consider because oftentimes utilization of of technology. It's not the tech itself, it's the other gray area that sometimes affects a business strategy. So that's something to consider. I also think what's really interesting about how especially satellites are growing and how space is growing, and you made this point about thinking about it in terms of markets, is that while the space sector and the space market is evolving, it does actually share a lot of characteristics with aviation and the cell phone industry. Because if you think about their trajectory, they all started with a government backbone. They had government funding, they had government regulation. Then they really went toward this trend toward commercializations. And that's really where we are now. So how can we utilize it? How can we expand it? 
And then where aviation and the cellular industry ended up going is creating this ecosystem to enable other markets and industries and new products and services that we didn't even think about before. And then it becomes a marketplace. I actually think we're going to see the same. We've certainly seen it with cell phone apps and others, but I think that how it's going to be used, we don't quite know yet, but there's going to be a lot of tremendous opportunity in the future. I hope that answered the question. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's very useful. And, and the examples that you mentioned are, are key to this. I think um, companies should be learning from other industries, like you say, and, and the, the regulatory, although the regulatory issues in some ways are going to be highly unique. If you have enough Earth observation satellites, enough return rate, you can tell where any private citizen is, essentially. You should, who should be able to do that? These are questions that um, are very important and are, and are coming. And like you say, are, are need to be answered soon. So on, on that, to, to move on to that, up to now, we focus mainly on commercial stakeholders and activities. But I wanted to ask you about the role of public money in the industry. And you've mentioned this a few times. You mentioned the importance of the space agencies in any, uh, the success of any space company. Obviously, you have um, a background in this area too. So we've worked with space engin engineers from space agencies around the world. And it's always fascinating to see the different incentivization models and strategies of work from smaller agencies in Africa and, and South Asia who have to focus on South America, who have to focus on capacity building. We don't have to, but are choosing to focus on capacity building and regional end user needs like connectivity and climate monitoring, that sort of thing. And then emerging powers like India, who you've touched on with a really ambitious national program. What do you see space agencies doing well? And where do you think maybe they could improve? It might be quite a broad question. So feel free to pick specific examples. I think what's interesting about this question is that, and, and to your point about different focuses of different countries is really it comes down to making space make sense for their country. Because at the end of the day, you have to justify why investing in space. I mentioned this a bit earlier, people not understanding the trickle down effects, but there really is a different answer globally. So the United States and more of these established nations and established spacefaring nations have the luxury of a, a legacy that they can showcase. So we, we've been engaging in space since the 1960s. And so when we talk about exploration and when we talk about investment going toward Artemis and eventually pushing toward Mars, while it may be met with some skepticism about sh shouldn't we and couldn't we divert dollars to something else, it's still collectively thought of as a good idea because we have a flag on the moon, right? We were the first ones there. When you go to more emerging nations who have very fundamental challenges on earth that their citizens are facing every day, Investing in space, if it's not communicated in the right way, can seem like a really bad move. I'll use Africa as an example because you brought them up. So there are many African nations that have satellites that are operating in space, but for a lot of their citizens, they need to put food on the table. And so for them, capacity building and this regional end user conversation is really important because you have to be able to demonstrate why space data is good for agricultural yields why these satellites flying around will allow the nation to actually move forward on the day-to-day -day life. And I think that communication about why space is critical across all agencies from all nations dependent on, it's not dependent on where they are uh, geographically. I think what I've seen agencies do well is really starting to embrace commercial ingenuity. And so beyond telling the story about why investing in space, it's also important to not just invest um, government dollars in space, but to be able to use commercial companies, use private companies, be able to integrate their capabilities into the national space strategy to further objectives. One of the examples around this is what we're seeing NASA do with the International Space Station and these commercial space stations that have been contracted. The ISS is, is old being decommissioned by 2030. And so instead of the agency building and integrating it themselves, they contracted private companies that NASA is then going to be a, a customer of, right? They're going to be providing services to NASA. And it's a really interesting and I think important model because it allows, I don't want to say like a lack of red tape, but it allows commercial 
to be leveraged by the government, but also commercial to build in commercial standards, which generally can move much quicker and differently. I think that one of the areas that can be improved is global collaboration. And not that it's not happening, it's just that it's quite tricky because anytime you start to talk about space activities, there are still friends and foes. It's just by the nature of how the space ecosystem came about with the space race. And I think that things like the Artemis Accords and being able to leverage capabilities of commercial companies, even if they're not located in your country, but they have something valuable to give to your national objectives, I think is really important. It's obviously an evolving conversation. It's something that there's a lot of push and pull there, but it's something that I think can be done more strategically and needs to be done more strategically in the future. Yeah, brilliant. All of that certainly tallies with with what we see in the industry. And I think also the incentivization of large-scale programs, like you mentioned with the, the private space stations, you can end up with improving global collaboration led by the commercial side of things. And we saw this recently with Starlab and the agreement with to work with ESA and Airbus moving forwards, which is obviously using NASA funding to develop the concept of the private space station, which is then realizing it would be useful if we had European customers to less, less make movements in that area. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I, we've touched on a whole range of things today. I think it's been really useful. Hopefully we, a lot of our listeners will have learned a lot. So thank you very much. And I just wanted to yeah finish up by giving the opportunity for our listeners to find out more about your contributions and achievements uh, in the context of what we've discussed so far. What are you and, and Space Foundation working on right now? What are you most excited about in the next few years? I appreciate the opportunity and I've I've really enjoyed this conversation. So a a bit about Space Foundation and where I sit and what I do. So the Space Foundation is 40 years old, actually we're 40 years old this year. And we are a convener and educator and an advocate on behalf of the global space community and global space ecosystem. So most people know us by our annual space symposium, which happens every April in Colorado Springs. This coming year will be our 39th year. And that's really where global business to government and business to business is done. On the other side of the house, we also do a lot of really robust K through 12 education because we truly believe that space begins in the classroom. And I fit in the middle of both of those. What I do and what I run is an area called Space Commerce Institute. It's a new department. We're about two years old. And really what we focus on is growth into and growth within the evolving space economy and really qualifying and quantifying opportunities. What I realized when I, before I designed the department is that the space industry, we talk to ourselves a lot. We talk in acronyms, we talk in statistics that really, if you're in the know and if you're not, and because the future has so many tremendous opportunities for new backgrounds, skill sets, interests, aptitude, there needed to be a place to really break down the trends and what they mean and how are these insertion points and how can people engage. And our bread and butter is partially thought leadership. We put out a lot of content so people can understand their place in space, but we also run a lot of space business focused programs. So we work with innovation centers or existing accelerators and incubators and attach on business content essentially. So we don't teach about space. We teach people how to do business in space and how to create space businesses. So that's a really exciting project because we've done it with everything from the Italian Space Agency. We have a program at an innovation center in South Florida. We're working with the Dutch Space Agency, touching a lot of different countries, a lot of different ecosystems, and really getting people to understand, to your point, if you don't have a space strategy now, you need to have a space strategy, but doing it in a really um, tangible and, and tactful way, as opposed to just hoping that you'll come out with some hype idea and you'll get investment because I want people to actually focus on the doing, not just the excitement. Thank you very much. That's a great place to finish up. You've shared a a whole wealth of information on commercialization and the space industry today, and hopefully there's plenty that will be really useful for our audience moving to 2024 and taking advantage of all the opportunities that, uh, that you've touched upon today. To all our listeners out there, thank you very much for spending time with us on the Space Industry Podcast. We'll share some details and links to the Space Foundation in our show notes, and you can find out more about the organization's work and indeed the Space Symposium event. 
And if you like our discussion today, please feel free to give us an honest rating and review on your podcast player of choice. It helps those platforms expose our show to more listeners and spread the word about the real stories in the commercial space industry today. We'd really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of The Space Industry by SatSearch. I hope you enjoyed today's story about one of the companies taking us into orbit. We'll be back soon with more in-depth, behind-the-scenes insights from private space businesses. In the meantime, you can go to satsearch.com for more information on the space industry today or find us on social media if you have any questions or comments. To stay up to date, please subscribe to our weekly newsletter and you can also get each podcast on demand on iTunes, Spotify, the Google Play Store or whichever podcast service you typically use.